Okay, so um, I have to say I've never been to TAG and I'm not re really a theory kind of girl. So this is going to be artifacts and some thoughts. And um, I prepared this one as my fun paper for this conference because I'm um, leading a whole session on mnemonics tomorrow, uh, which I'm also looking forward to, but I don't actually, I just have to sort of um, do like the presenter bit that um, Penny does rather than um, speaking. So this was my, my fun paper for preparation. And I should say, um, I put this in more as a as a geeky thing because I thought, oh, I'm sure I'm sure somebody else will do that and somebody much more um, much better than than I. But um, clearly, nobody thought that it's really pretty pretty bleeding obvious um, <laughs> to discuss archaeology in the next generation because I thought, quite frankly, that it was. So um, do I use? Yeah. So um, just to just to prove that I'm a proper geek. Um, what I'll be talking about will be memory alpha, not beta. So um, basically, <laughs> I know that means that this talk is basically based on the um, Star Trek Next Generation series and a couple of movies only. <laughs> I think not very much of um, literature, books, anything that um, sort of any random people that sort of take the characters and run away with them. I admit that maybe some books are quite good, but I think um, it would be very difficult to sort of have, have a, any kind of sort of coherent thought um, about this if you, yeah, if, if I would work with memory better. So I've decided that um, I'll stick with um, my purest nature and it'll just be the seventh series of hundreds of episodes and um, the couple of movies. I know they're rubbish, but still, <laughs> they are um, the core of what is started with the next generation. Um, I should also say, I think the reason why maybe um, Star Trek The Next Generation is um, so close to my heart, two reasons. Firstly, I'm a child of the 80s, and that was when um, Star Trek got resurrected, and I didn't watch the, this orig the um, original Next Generation, I watched the German reruns, so if my pronunciation is a bit weird, that's why. <laughs> I, have watched, I have watched it in English, I have the entire series and everything at home, of course, like any sane person would. Um, but um, I've only managed to watch it three or four times, and I think what <laughs> my sort of my inner being is still very much attached to, um, yeah, the, the German version. So you know, for anything that's not properly pronounced, I do apologise. Um, so yeah, archaeology in space—it's a pretty, pretty weird concept, I guess. Um, and to be fair, archaeology does probably play quite a limited role in, um, in the next generation. And I think I probably noticed that because I, uh, when I was little, what I wanted to be when I um, grown up was um, an, um, um, an astronaut. I did ask my mum to search for this picture that I drew in second grade, which was um, the task was draw what your mum does, draw what your dad does, and draw a picture of you, what you want to be when you grow up. And I drew myself with a goldfish bowl and in an um, astronaut suit next to a rocket and that's what I wanted to be. No questions asked. I told my teacher and my teacher said to me, ooh, but you're pretty rubbish at math and you wear glasses. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> and maybe this is, maybe it's a slight flaw in the German education system. It basically, um, all my heart that was in space went like, oof. And I thought, what am I going to do now? Anyway, I developed a, um, yeah, my, my love for history and archaeology and basically stuck with that, so it's all good. And then I, yeah, I, I found um, Star Trek and started watching it, and I think I was always quite sort of pleased that um, Captain Jean-Luc Picard, the captain of the Enterprise, actually did archaeology um, at university as well. And obviously he didn't cho choose that career. Why? I wouldn't. I don't know really why he chose to be a Star Trek captain, but... He, um, he did, and, um, but he never quite lost the love for archaeology, and you can, in, like in the entire series, you can see him going to conferences, he, um, when he goes on holiday, he will, he will um, go to museums and um, visit ruins, and he is, he's maybe a little bit of a closet archaeologist, um, rather than, um, you know, just somebody who gets dragged into the museum, like my own family, who hated, really, quite frankly. I also thought, what I really liked about um, 
Star Trek and in the next generation, and they have actually that in the original series as well, they have a so-called ANA officer on board, which I think is a really cool idea. This is the archaeology and anthropology officer who um, basically, um, I can only imagine what this person's job is because, um, again, it's not one of the main strands of, of the next generation or indeed the original series. It's just occasionally when they end up on a on a far, um, on a on an alien planet, or they get artifacts handed, or whatever, um, the A and A um, officer comes in and um, will look at things, or will have a look at ruins. And in fact, the A and A officer in um, in the next generation, somebody called Nala Aster, um, died. The episode isn't actually about her; it's about how her son copes with her death. But she dies, and you have to wrap your head around this. She dies whilst looking at ancient catacombs and ruins on this alien planet and they were um, um, tricked with, um, with bombs and the, the tricorder or whatever couldn't pick it up and basically they tripped one up and everything blew up and she died. And that, make, that got me thinking, that is it's pretty amazing. I mean, we are, it, it touches a little bit on what we've, um, what we've heard before. For us, time is linear and in some ways, because um, Next Generation has been written by people, for people, about people in the, in the future. I suppose the, the time, in some ways, the main timeline is linear as well, but we are not talking about some kind of Earth timeline. It's, the ti it's like the universe timeline, which is a hell of a lot longer. I mean, our, our history and prehistory um, is like what? Like with artifacts and everything? Like, like a million years or something? Maybe a bit less, but you get more artifacts? It's not, it's like in, in the universe's terms, it's not very long. So whilst maybe our ancestors were working with stone tools on a different planet, a whole civilization, um, like a, some Roman Empire type thing, went up and then up in flames and died and maybe they killed off the planet and that's it and there's just ruins left. And then there's us 3,000 years later traveling to that planet. So it brings a whole new dimension into what is time and what, um, yeah, what, you know, something that is in our past. I mean, you, I suppose you could probably kill somebody with a, with a stone tool. I'm pretty sure you probably could. But um, they didn't have any explosive devices. But on a different planet where the civi ancient civilizations were a lot earlier, you, yeah, you might go visit ruins, but because you don't know very much about them or about the history, or maybe you can't read the writing or whatever, you, you don't know they had explosive devices in the past, and that's it. So it's, um, it's, yeah, it's. I suppose in an ideal world, if I were, if I was a twenty, um, twenty-fourth century girl, I think that's my, that would be my ideal job here, A and A officer. Not necessarily a whole dying bit, but. Um, I, would, I wouldn't mind being on the spaceship, but not as an astronaut, but as an archaeologist. I like that. I think that's, a, that's good. So, um, so yeah, archaeology in space. I found this really rather, um, very sadly, very grainy picture of Captain Picard with archaeologist's tools, which I thought I'd put in there as a little bit of a, yeah, of a... <laughs> I'm not, it, it never really gets explained what this is. I think he's about to embark on a, on a holiday. I go to a conference or something. I can't, I can't remember what it's taken out of, but he, he's got these tools and that's what he wants to take. And you can tell that the whole series obviously was written by somebody who is not a specialist and it was back in the um, early 1980s, late 70s. And, but archaeologists are, you can recognize them because they have a spade thing. It's not really a spade, but it's not really a shovel either. And I wouldn't want to dig with this personally, but clearly in the 23rd, um, 20, uh, 23rd century, that's the tool. I'm not quite sure what this is either. It looks a bit like a... I'm, not, I'm, I'm just not sure. They don't explain it. That's the beauty of it. I've no idea what it is, but this is Picard with his archaeologist's tools, whatever it is that, that, he, did, that he does with them. I like the fact that... Um, Starfleet has a, an institute, the Daystrom Institute, um, and there is actually um, an, an archaeological research centre. So you can study archaeology at Starfleet at the university. It is something that you can do, and that, that Picard obviously did. He was his um, Professor Galens, that was his teacher at university, and a very renowned archaeologist, renowned all over the um, all over the um, galaxy, I should say, um, and he he would have wanted Captain Picard dearly to become an archaeologist and um, walk in his footsteps, but um, 
much to his um, great sadness, Captain Picard decided to become, well, to join um, Starfleet proper and go on to become um, the captain of the Enterprise. And um, Galen does come back and um, they have not kept in touch, um, but for one uh, final mission, which I'll get into in a minute, um, he does need Picard's help and he's sort of trying to, well, speak to the archaeologist in him, um, who, well, which answers really positively, obviously, because um, also in the, um, <laughs> in, the, in the future there doesn't really seem to be any research grants you have to apply for to go on missions. <laughs> you can, and get this, just take the Enterprise, of course, <laughs> and go to wherever your ancient archaeology professor wants you to go. He's got this amazing idea, and you go, yeah, that's brilliant. I take my 4,000 crew and family, and that's what we'll do. So they did. Happy times. Um, yes, I should maybe um, just a little bit of thought about the Prime Directive. Now, there is no written book or anything on the Prime Directive, um, as you would imagine there will be in the future, or there should be, or there is in Star Trek anyway. Um, and it's the, the Prime Directive is the basically the, the law, the, 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 the most important guidelines that um, people basically um, work under, and that's the non-interference directive, um, something we, I think, should apply maybe a little bit more ferociously to our life, but um, well, that aside, um, basically it, it's, it's concerned with, with living people, so if you have a spaceship and you travel around and you come to a planet um, where they haven't developed space, space travel yet, um, do you go down and say, here, I have a spaceship, look, this is amazing, come with us. And um, in the original series, they thought sometimes, Captain Kirk sometimes thought it was a good idea, but basically they just caused havoc and destruction. So and the Prime Directive was, um, was put together and you can see Picard and his, um, and his crew um, struggling sometimes to adhere to it, but um, they do generally. Um, now, I sort of took, took it in, a, in the world of theory a little bit further if you do not interfere with the living, which is fair enough, can you interfere with the dead? Because as we'll see in a minute, there is a lot of artifacts about. If you think about, you don't just, just mind exercise. You have this one world, which is Earth, and you have hundreds of millions of cultures, what, what it feels like. You've got lots of continents, you've got lots of countries. Even within the countries, you've got different regions, different areas, different villages. And all of us are probably studying a tiny little facet of that. And to be fair, we could probably have thousands of archaeologists studying tiny little facets, and now multiply that by a thousand. The universe is infinite. Obviously, they know um, they haven't explored everything, but there is at least 60 planets in the United Federation of Planets, and um, it's, it's just a huge undertaking. So what do you do if you... if for example, an artifact from another world is being offered to you. What if, um, you know, there's a, a lot more, a lot, I mean, we are struggling to understand our ancient cultures, but what if you get to a planet that is maybe not, um, not um, home to a humanoid um, life form? What if it's a gas life form? What if it's um, a fairy life form? I don't know, you know, it's just like, just think about it. And will they have a past? Will they preserve it or not? Will there be ruins or not? It's, um, it's something that, in my world, maybe um, they could have explored a little bit more, but I can see how it might get a bit boring for some people, possibly, watching that. But um, I thought that maybe in a, th in a theoretical world, the Prime Directive, which obviously um, in the book only refers to living things, I'm pretty sure there would be some subparagraphs saying, well, in, in the archaeological world, this is what you shouldn't do. So, um, artifacts. I thought I'll just, um, I had a very quick look through the episodes that I've got at home and um, the, um, um, the wiki page that gives you information just generally about everything Star Trek. And um, yeah, I just put a couple of artifacts together which I thought were quite, um, quite amusing. So there's, for example, this one. Sorry about the slightly crappy screenshot. It's a garland prayer stick, whatever that may be. If you look it up, um, nobody explains to you what this garland are they, is it, is it a place? Is it a planet? Is it what is it? No idea. But it's a prayer stick. But what we do know is it's an extremely rare artifact, but it has no real value as antique. As um, 
Yeah, except perhaps, this is what um, uh, Jean-Luc Picard said, possibly just for archaeologists. So there's a value attached to things. It's, it's something that is clearly, well, that was, um, was described as valueless on its home planet, and it's valueless in, um, in, um, in, in, on other planets as well. But obviously, as, as an archaeologist, you see maybe a little bit more behind rather mundane. You're kidding, right? I have a little flexibility. Okay, right. <laughs> Let's carry on. This is a slightly funnier artifact, which I've put in for, in, yeah, exactly, for the um, anthropologists amongst us. Who knows what this is? I can see you do because you're giggling. Oh dear. A hall gun is, is more of an, um, it's, it's an old um, Ryzen artifact, and nobody really knows what it implies, but apparently when you carry it around, you are asking or seeking um, Yamaha Ron. Nobody knows what that is. But it's um, a mysterious and pleasurable sexual practice native to that world. And it's just, it's, um, it used to be an artifact. Now there's lots of replicas about, a little bit like you can buy replicas of the, um, of the Holy Grail or stuff like that. You can, you can even, this picture is taken from Amazon, by the way. <coughs> you can still get them today, but that's in a temporal world. Not, you will be able to get them, but you can already get them, so don't, don't confusing. Um, then we have... That's very exciting for anybody who's interested in myth. It's, um, I've been asked to hold this entire lecture in Klingon, but um, my Klingon is a bit rusty, so I don't. Um, but if um, they've created this whole history and prehistory and archaeology and, um, and myth around the Klingons, which are, well, the main sort of one of, one of the main humanoid life forms the humans interact with, if, if you know Star Trek well. And um, there is a lot of. Um, they are in some ways quite similar maybe to our early medieval dark agey people, but not, not really. But they, um, there's this, this sword that they go, go look for. It's the original sword of Kallus, which was, a, um, was, was the first ruler of the Klingon Empire. And um, a lot of myth comes in and where it was found. And it's, uh, I really like that episode because it gives you a little bit of background. It's, it's a bit, of an, I suppose, what we all want to do. We have maybe some texts that tell us about these mystical things like the Holy Grail and then somebody goes, oh, you know what, I think I found it. And with the, um, with, um, the 23rd century technology, they can actually check for, you know, tricorders, they can actually check um, the exact age. They don't need, you know, apply for research grants and radiocarbon date things. They just make it beep and then it tells you 9th century. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, um, again, I'm not getting into that. I was just horrified. This is, this is the scene in which Captain Picard, there he is, um, he is visited by Professor Galen, and um, Professor Galen <coughs> wants him to to go on this on this search for um, for various um, artifacts. And in order to get his um, well perk his, his interest, he gives him this, which is a Kola nice cos. And I I've never noticed that, but it's probably because I'm slightly more I don't know I'm older, maybe slightly wiser, more boring. But when I saw that, I thought. Oh my god, I'm a museum curator by the way, so when I saw that, it was on his desk and he, he opened it and I'm like, oh, gloves, gloves, <laughs> because, because he'd, he'd spent five minutes explaining what an amazing rare artifact this is and there's like none like it and it's, and Captain Picard goes, oh my god, is it complete? And he goes, well, open it and so Captain Picard opens the lid and as you can see, it's got lots of little figures inside and I haven't got the time to get into what they mean, but somebody, some person, um, who knows a little bit about archaeology and anthropology actually thought about this. Seeing it's only in there for about, I don't know, three minutes is a bit of a shame, really. But it's an exciting artifact. And I'm just like, my god, if it's so rare, just use gloves or something. But he doesn't. <laughs> so this is that's the downfall of Captain Picard. Yeah. Um, the um, people always complained <coughs> that um, in Star Trek, why do why why it's just it's just humans in costumes, isn't it? It's just like they they never really look like they they all look like us, so it's that's not really real. But in um, in the next generation, they actually try to explain that. They explain why Klingons and Cardassians and Vulcans and Romulans and Andorians and all of these people are humanoid um, life forms, and they explain it with this theory of panspermia. Look it up; it's quite exciting, really. <laughs> um, and I just I just took again I took it a level further because you get on on these on these planets and with these civilizations you get a lot of things that are very similar to what we have like houses, tables, chairs, you get um, slightly weird looking cutlery, you get glasses but I find there can actually be 
explained by that because if, if some some seed has been sown that makes us all into humanoid life forms we all drink and eat in more or less the same way we sit um so it's i think maybe explaining the um why artifacts maybe look quite similar um you know that might might be explained by um by this um this theory yeah then just quickly to go into the good and the bad i'm not quite sure how many people um know the characters but we have the good here captain john luc picard handling some old pottery that he's found somewhere yeah. <laughs> he's on the way to a conference and um he is about to talk about about these bits of pottery the, to me they look like really modern sort of um red sort of non-glazed red earthenware things but i'm not pottery specialist yeah so and then we have um then we have um wash who is um a lady he meets on holiday who um he meets on holiday and finds out first he um she seems to be um a student of archaeology and really interested in archaeology and then it turns out she's actually bad she's an un she's an archaeologist and antiquity dealer she um yeah so we have like i said the good and the bad we've got captain john luc picard who studied archaeology he's got a lifelong interest he's maybe what we call a, a renowned amateur archaeologist somebody who's actually done his his stuff done the degree but he he's obviously doing something slightly more lucrative now um and but he's still interested in archaeology so there we go and then we have vash who studied at arch studied archaeology she actually made it up to research assistant um but then greed took over and she went rogue yeah so and then yeah she got um roped into doing nasty things <coughs> with this guy hugh who is um yeah that you can't really say they had a love affair but he basically offered her because he can time travel to take her to all sorts of exciting planets where she can basically find the most amazing artifacts that can I don't know, glow in the dark, bring internal happiness, but not for herself to sell them because she's greedy. So very bad. Yeah. So, you know, there would be, you could, I, I was taking it too far really. There are several issues that can be explored in a nice way. They still, and, and here I think you, one really can see that, yes, it was written by late 20th century people who don't, who didn't really know archeology span or history, but they did sort of put um, things and that we, we still have today and that we have then. We have a university, we have lecturers, professors, research, we have excavations, conferences. Even Picard speaks at conferences on archaeology. I would, I would die to see that. <laughs> when does he have time to do research? Honestly, he's fighting people and doing like all sorts of exciting things and, that, and then he's time to put an archaeology lecture together as well for conferences. Yeah, we also have museums, and they have this really exciting new museum, which is the Fleet Museum for decommissioned starships. Again, a place I would love to be a curator at, but not for another 200 years. Yeah, uh, I'm not getting into, into the dark side, because we all know what is illicit trade of antiquities, people who clearly have no idea and no interest in archaeology and what context and things mean, and money is everything. Um, yeah, and then it's, I got sort of a... I got, I got a bit carried away, so you can, you can read this and maybe we can, we can discuss it since we've got a little bit more time. Um, yeah, it's like, why does he touch stuff, all the stuff with gloves? They've got artifacts and he sees things and it's like, why well, surely he should have gloves to touch them? He's, he's so good, but no. But um, yeah, and then I've mentioned that before that he, um, this whole panspermia thing, I, I really like the episode, but just thinking about it in modern archaeology terms, I really don't get how he can say, yeah actually we've got three weeks so why not let's just go and explore various planets and do some excavations in a not very academic or professional way we just haul things out of ground and you know that's it yeah so yeah and then um i think that might actually might nearly last like nearly so um then i thought about the yeah this one here yes i'm from the northwest by the way and i thought first i thought why well, shouldn't all things be in a museum and i've just had a quick chat with um um, penny about that and I used to I used to think yes everything should be in a museum but I now work in a museum and now I'm like oh maybe not everything should be in a museum um, because basically we have too much stuff and too little storage we really do and and what do you keep what do you throw away should really everything be in a museum can it be elsewhere what do we do with the stuff it's all semantics really I've no idea um, maybe our our um, the 
early 21st century will be known as um, the time when we learned how to throw things away rather than how to accumulate things, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I was thinking because in, in this future often Captain Picard or others use artifacts to take to different planets as a gift for example, or he gets given gifts. Um, which are daggers or this prayer stick or what have you, uh, you know, different things. I'm thinking, well, why, how do that, what is their right to have something like on the Enterprise, maybe something that was never meant to leave the planet? <coughs> is, it's just like, is, uh, is, it, is it okay to do that? And then I thought, well, for example, a Langdale axe. Yes, you know, I live in Cumbria, so I see a, little, I see a lot of Langdale axes. I do. Um, well, we have so many of them. In some ways, maybe it would be okay to have a, you know, to, and it would probably survive in a museum and in 200 years if a starship captain took that to an alien planet. How cool would that be if Captain Picard with the Langdale Axe would go here, this is our present, this is from our past. Um, so maybe it is, maybe it is, a, is an, maybe it is a, good, a good thing to do, I don't know, it's maybe something to be discussed. Yeah, and then that brought me into the whole idea of um, the past and the past and uh, object biographies and things. But yeah, see I'm already out of time. About six five minutes, minutes about six <laughs> minutes over. So I'm not going to go into that. But thinking about future, about sort of today's objects in the future. So it's our there. Yeah, it's like I'm not going to wrap my head around that. Maybe next time. Anyway, there you go.